Good morning, good morning, and welcome to our midweek services here at Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, where the Reverend Ellie Campbell is pastor. We're delighted you've uh, joined us again for another midweek Bible study. Uh, we have an exciting lesson this week, and we're looking forward to getting into it. We are on Lesson 3, dated for June the 16th, this coming Sunday, Father's Day, hint, hint. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we are in the first unit, Experiencing Hope, and our subject this week is Hope Amid Differences. So we welcome those of you who are here in, in the dining room, and all those, all those of you who are uh, uh, at uh, who are at home. This is a special day. Uh, Sister Miley Davis will be meeting with us later on today. We'll be celebrating her 104 years here on this earth. We praise God for her, and uh, we just want to keep holding her up. All right, before we get started, let's uh, go to the throne of grace, a word of prayer and then we'll get going into our lesson. Let's look to God. Father in heaven, we come to you now thanking you for uh, the privilege of life once more. You blew your divine breath on our eyes. We opened them up and saw a brand new day. Father, we thank and praise you that we were able to put our feet on the floor. We were enclosed in our right mind and uh, with a reasonable portion of health and strength. And then, Father, you gave in us, you've planted in us the desire to learn more about your word so we'll become more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we just thank you, Father, for this place. We thank you for the uh, families that are represented here. We thank you for the technology to reach out to our members uh, in cyberspace who can't be here. And we ask you, Father, to uh, whether it's here in person or in cyberspace, that you bless the families that are represented. And now, Lord, we pray that uh, uh, you bless our pastor, that you strengthen him in any way that he needs strengthening. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, worked long and hard in, in your vineyard, and he just pleased, he, he is just pleased to do your will. Uh, thank you for what we've learned uh, uh, through him and the foundation that has been laid here at Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. And lastly, Father, we pray that you take us down into the deep treasures of your word, uh, help us to rightly divide the word of truth and not move to the left or the right, uh, to cut it straight uh, and as is your will. So, Father, we just thank you once more. We pray that everything we do will glorify and magnify you and edify the saints of God. And these blessings we ask in the name of Jesus and for sake we pray. Amen. Amen, and thank God. Amen. So our subject this week is hope amidst differences. Hope amid differences. Our devotional reading is found in the book of Philippians, the second chapter, uh, the first 13 verses. And our background scripture is found in the uh, 15th chapter of the book of Romans, verses 1 through 13, and our print passage is the same. If you have your books or if you have your handouts, uh, please read with me the NIV version, uh, and, uh, and we'll get moving here. Let's, let's read. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each and every. Christ had, had, so that when one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's Romans 15, 5 through 16. Our lesson aims this week are to, first of all, contrast the Christian concept 
of hope with secular concepts. And this is nothing new because we've, we've talked about biblical hope, Christian hope, in previous lessons uh, this past quarter and in uh, our present quarter. The second is to value the Old Testament as a vital repository for Christian hope. And lastly, commit to acts of service boosted by hope and the spirit, even in the face of obstacles. So that is, uh, those are our lesson aims, those are our challenges. I invite you, those of you who have your Sunday school book, to look at your key terms and also read the introduction. Uh, I took for a background right out of the biblical text on page 18 in our Sunday school uh, books, and we'll be reading that momentarily. Now, we have three analysis of the biblical text uh, this week. Um, uh, a lengthy lesson, we want to try to get through it, and and because uh, there's a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of meat uh, for us uh, today. So in terms of our analysis of the biblical text, we have three, as I said. The first is entitled, Follow Christ's Example. Follow Christ's Example. And this is found in Romans 15, 1 through 7. Our second analysis of the biblical text is hope for all, hope for all, found in Romans, the fifth chapter, the 18th through the 13th verses. And finally, did I skip one? What did I do? Oh, there's only two. I, I guess I'm thinking about next week's lesson because um, uh, there's two analysis of the biblical text. Excuse me, y'all, and y'all out in cyberspace. So that's two, but they're lengthy like there should be a third one. Uh, at any rate, we're going to, uh, to delve in uh, to uh, uh, our lesson at this point in time. All right. So we've read our key verse found in Romans 15, 5 through 6. Uh, and uh, now we'll get into uh, our background, go to our handouts, and learn a little bit about our background. As I said, I took this from the biblical context uh, located on page 18, upper left-hand corner of our Sunday School books. Paul is the author of the book of Romans, and the epistle is named for its recipients, the church members in Rome. Rome at that time, the capital of the Roman Empire. Paul wrote Romans from Corinth toward the close of his third missionary journey around A.D. 56. And he wrote this letter to teach the gospel principles to those in Rome who had never been exposed to apostolic teaching. So the church in Rome was not established by an apostle, but it was established by individuals who had been converted went back home to Rome and started, uh, started a church there. Uh, the church at Rome was a mixed congregation. And if you read the book of Romans, you'll see where Paul deals with uh, uh, Jewish culture and beliefs, and he also deals with uh, uh, Hellenistic uh, beliefs and, and culture. So we want to keep that in mind as, as we uh, move along. Now, Paul's theme uh, for this book, for this letter, was the righteousness of God, which presents the good news that salvation is obtained by grace through faith in Christ alone. Underline that. Salvation is obtained by grace through faith in Christ alone. Jesus plus nothing. There's no book. There's no special unction from other sources. Jesus Christ is a foundation of our faith and our salvation. Now, Paul addresses this vital doctrine theologically and practically. In the first 11 chapters, he systematically represents the doctrine of 
justification by faith. Then in chapters 12 through 15, he teaches how believers in Christ may apply the doctrine that he has just taught. So how to apply the doctrine of justification by emphasizing how those strong in faith should live in relationship to those with weaker faith. And we'll be talking about that as we, we get into our analysis of the biblical text. Uh, notably, Paul insists that those with strong faith should trust God enough to imitate Christ's example by serving others and above pleasing themselves. That's very important. We are to serve each other. We are to love each other. We'll be talking about that as we go along in our lesson. So let's go to our analysis of the biblical text following Christ's example, Romans 15, the first seven verses, but I've uh, for, for explanation, uh, we've broken, broken things up here. So I want you to read, if you would, the first verse of Romans, the 15th chapter. And this is coming from the NIV version. Let's read. We are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. All right. The main thing to understand is that we have different levels of maturity in our Christian walk. Sanctification, which means becoming more and more Christ-like, is a process we engage in all of our lives. Becoming more Christ-like entails walking in the Spirit. So what does this suggest? It suggests, first of all, we have to have the attitude uh, to be more Christ-like. And, and we uh, should endeavor, we should grab hold. The Greek word is, uh, I believe, lambasso, to grab, to grasp. And, and we, uh, uh, as, as we're in our Christian walk, uh, we, we need to be mindful of who we are uh, and where we're going. And uh, so... Our part is to have the desire and the availability to walk. And then we must walk in the spirit. And we're going to, along the way, we'll be enduring trials. We'll be enduring affliction. uh, But most importantly, uh, we're going to be engaging in a growing relationship with the Lord. And I might add at this stage, each other. Uh, um, Galatians 6, 1 through 4 uh, says this. And let's, let's read that first paragraph, starting with brothers and sisters. Go ahead. All right, let's let's stop there. Now, as we read this, uh, uh, what we are inter- uh, what we are encouraged to do, and I didn't look at the verb there, but it, it may also be a command. I, I have to go back, uh, but at any rate, uh, we are encouraged to those who are caught in the sin, uh, uh, and uh, uh, those of us who live by the Spirit who possess the Christian maturity, should restore that person gently. Now, what sin are we talking about? We're not talking about the sin that separates us from God eternally. We're talking about the everyday things that that we do. We may fall out with each other. We we may have an issue with with someone. And uh, so those of us who are 
uh, uh, more spiritually mature, uh, uh, we need to uh, be mindful and we need to uh, uh, watch ourselves because the same thing that happened to your brother or sister can happen to you. The same thing. So uh, uh, we can't think that uh, we, uh, we can't do it. Yes, Sister Mitch, we going, you getting ready to get a... So, so we who are not spiritually mature... Uh, so what do we do? We just ask someone who is spiritually mature? Because this is a month where, in my opinion, is just full of just uh, totally against God, you know, the, the gay yeah. pride block, et cetera. And um, there's no way to, to gently correct these people because they are so entrenched in their, their lifestyle, right? And you got other people, well, we have to be supportive of this, blah, 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 even though we don't practice it, that type of attitude, too, you know. So that, I myself don't think I am spiritually mature enough to confront and to, to um, gently correct. Well, I disagree with you because I think you are. Uh, the issue is when we're having those conversations, what should we address? Should we address the behavior and yeah. what we don't like? Or should we address the person's need for salvation and, and their need to uh, uh, follow the tenets of the Lord? Yes. Because if they're going their own way and rationalizing and justifying their own behavior, uh, yeah. uh, you know, you're not, you're not going to uh, uh, make a lot of inroads with that individual. But I would suggest that in all our witnessing that we talk about what the Lord has done and, for and us. Written, right. yeah. So, and, and I think despite those who engage in the lifestyle, some feel uncomfortable uh, with the lifestyle. And, and therefore uh, um, um, are looking for uh, an answer because really they're they're not sure and and I think we we have to keep that we have to keep that in mind so but here when we look at this particular passage who is that talking about this is talking about Christians and and uh, uh, to answer your original question I believe you are mature enough to deal to deal with it but but we got to take ourselves and and uh, I hate to use the word disdain, but right. take ourselves and and out of uh, that that mindset. We want to uh, provide a way for people to come. The God has provided the way, right. but we have to approach them uh, in in a way that. Uh, demonstrates and shows that, that we're Christians. Amen. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. Um, I just don't know. I've had several confrontations, but I think that each one is general. Yeah, understood. And, and you but we struggle with that. Go ahead, Rev. And you won't even know if it went well or not. You don't, we don't even know because the way the spirit works, you know, you can just put that word out to them. But, you know, and it's, I think this whole thing is about attitude, how you approach the person. It's, it's what he's saying, he's saying uh, when, when uh, uh, we did that are strong, that, Mac, talk, go to somebody that's weak. Don't, don't put your strength in front of them. You know, um, I, I, this is the same. I had this, we had this lesson back in, the, back in the past, and the lady in the back, she asked the guy that was giving the lesson, she says, then why are you so pharisaic? Because, see, people go to people, and mm. they know they know probably got, got more acknowledge about the scripture, but don't, don't lay that on somebody so hard. You know, go to them as if it was you. That's what Paul is saying. Because it might be you the next time. Right. Yeah, go to them as if, if you were the one. So you go there in a humble manner, and, and they will understand you better. Amen. Amen. Yes, yeah, on. Heard you loud and clear. 
the, the other thing is, and, and let's focus on the Christian church because Paul is talking to Christians, isn't he? Okay. So the gospel message should be taken to non-believers. But in the Christian church, if someone sins or, or, or has a misstep, uh, we should be able to restore them in a spirit of meekness. Uh, uh, and, and, and I like what pastor says is that, especially in the Christian church, we need to have the relationship or the ability at times. You can approach someone in, in the church that you have a relationship with. But if, if, if you come and, and you, uh, um, if you come and you don't yeah. have that relationship with that individual, they won't hear you as readily as if you do. And that's what he means by, by that. Yes, sir. Just briefly, uh, you know, Paul, Paul being a uh, church planner, uh, he was always uh, making sure that the, the body of Christ was uh, kept in order. So he's always doing in-house cleaning, you know, making sure people's conduct was on point. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of what Dave was talking about, he, he was doing in-house cleaning. People that was faithful in showing up, but they had some conduct problems, you know. Uh, uh, policing, policing belongs inside the body of Christ. You see somebody coming to church all the time, Bible study, and they, you see them do something wrong, uh, that person should be approachable as far as if they have a misconduct in their walk. Uh, and that's what the body of Christ is all about. We try to keep each other on point as far as our walk with the Lord. And, uh, you know, everybody in this room should be approachable. If I see somebody doing something wrong, I should be able to approach them and say, listen, uh, but I'll pull you to the side. I wouldn't do it in front of nobody else. It would be one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if you did it in front of a lot of people, of course, that's going to be okay. They did that in front of everybody. But if it was just like something personal, I'm going to pull you to the side and say, listen, uh, I felt disrespected by you. But I'm going to pull you to the side and say that. I'm not going to front you all. But uh, pa Paul was always doing that in the churches. You know, this guy was really uh, uh, serious about keeping the churches in check. And it was a lifestyle that he lived. So, that, you know, but you got to, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really touchy subject, man, as far yeah. as checking somebody else. Well, you know. Yeah, it's, it can be it touchy, can be touchy but, but the thing is, this is a two-way street we're talking about. So if you're the person who's being approached to be admonished or correct, yeah. corrected, what's your attitude toward being approached? So it, it's a two-way street. If I'm going to approach you, I need to do it in the proper spirit. But I also, on the other hand, have to be in the mindset that when I'm approached, that I accept that, right, that I can deal with that. And, and so, you know, one-way street, Long Ranger stuff, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't work in, in the Christian church. So who are the spiritual? Those who, those who are saved, those who uh, um, uh, have, have that maturity and this, those who are spiritual don't always have to have, you know how people you say about, I've been on this journey a long time. Yeah. Well, you could have been on the journey and been wrong a long time. <laughs> yeah. That's right, Dave. So, so the, <laughs> so the, the spiritual are those who, who have the patience <laughs> and they're allowing that the spirit of God uh, to work with them. Sister Brookins, oh, I got to say that the first time. <laughs> Right, Amen. Um, Praise God. This is a touchy subject, but like yeah. Tracy said, um, you know, some things are, uh, what, what did you say? Um, well, you, 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 it's if touchy. It's down, you know, if it's done in front of others, right, somebody disrespects you or right. 
And, well, but it was one on one. Okay, you flew him to the I, side. I want to bring up a touchy uh, event that just took place, which is with Dr. Tony Evans. Yeah. Now he decided he's going to step down from pastoralship after 48 years because of something he did a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Number one, we don't know what the sin was. Right. But it is, what do you, what's your take on that? Because I, well, I just feel like yeah, uh, we all sin and fall short. Sure we do. Yeah. And, and uh, if, because I read that article and he yeah. did consult with his elder board, he called it. He did consult with them and he did get input from them. Right. But obviously he's been dealing with this, struggling with this a long time. And, it, and, and he may have resisted for a long time. But, but his actions tell me that uh, uh, um, he decided it was, was better because what he had done is, is still some old business and he's trying to deal with it. So, so that was not conducive to his leadership in his church. So he decided to step down. So uh, that's kind of my take. Uh, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. But, uh, That's news to me, man. Tony stepped down, huh? Yeah, he did. He did step down. Yeah, pastor says you have to be able to forgive yourself. And he might, he might never have forgiven himself for what, what he did. So. Is that an example of being hypocritical if you're still serving with a sin that you haven't resolved? Well, I, th I, I think a hypocrite is, is, is an actor, right? right. Uh, put, put on a mask. And, and uh, you know, some, some of the behavior may have been quote unquote hip hypocritical. But I think when the spirit leads you to a, a, a specific place and you can't get over it, and he continues to work on you and say, hey, you, you need to work on, you need to address this. Exactly. Uh, um, but we, you know, we struggle. Yes, sir, Dad. That's right. We, we struggle with these issues. We're not perfect. We struggle throughout our existence. We struggle all our lives. And, and, and so, uh, this brother, even though 40 years, he, he struggled with it. And as Pastor pointed out, he, he didn't forgive himself. Oh, right. A good side, Pastor said, is a good side to hypocrisy. What do you mean, Pastor? You keep doing the right thing, although you don't feel like doing it. Exactly. He, he, he had that sin that was out there that he never forgave himself for. Remember, David did the same thing, remember? Yeah. Until Nathan confronted David. David did the same thing. So he's not, he was, he even the first person that done it. He won't be the last one to do it. But it's in scripture where David did it. Right. And it was Nathan that brought his sin before him. That's right. He had to confront him with it. And, and we're the same way. We're indwelled by the, the, the spirit of God. And the Spirit of God keeps holding that mirror up in front of us and saying, hey, look, this is you. Or you may have heard something somewhere. And in the message, the Holy Spirit says, okay, this is you. Yeah. You've, been, you yeah. you've been resisting this for so long. This is you. And, and so our job is to... Uh, um, is, is to listen to and respond to the Holy Spirit. Now, before we get off Galatians 6, I, I want to say something here, and Pastor has taught us this. Uh, uh, verses 2 and 4 are not contradictions. Verses 2 and 4 are not contradictions. Hmm. Can't get it. He'll show you. Praise God. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Deacon Smith, we've got to be realized, we've got to be confident that we will all X something. No one is perfect. And because we all X something, I think that uh, nigga's gonna get any better. As we go stronger in Christ, then it's gonna get worse. And that's a lead pipe cinch. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. You won't say it here? Oh, okay. Okay. Now, you know, Paul killed Christians. I mean, Paul saw it out. So what could be any worse than for Tony, Reverend Tony Davis, who? Tony oh, Tony Evans, okay. What could be worse for him? Because Paul was like the worst, and God had him, you know, turned him around on the road of Damascus. So in my mind, I'm thinking, what could the man have done worse than Paul that he would give up after 48 years? You know, and, and because God, through Jesus Christ, we have our, we can make amends and we can face whatever it is. Whatever it is we have to face. If we truly are believers of God through Jesus Christ, I mean, there's nothing anybody could say that could damage, because we know Paul's history, but it doesn't damage his writings, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You understand? And so, in my mind, I'm just thinking, this is personally, what in the world could the man have to father a lot of babies or, you know? <laughs> I'm just curious, because nobody could be worse than Paul, and just like he mentioned about David, oh my God, sometimes when I read Psalms, David was always doing wrong, but he always repented. Yeah. He always repented, and he wasn't conscious of who this man was until Nathan came and told him. He said, what would you do? And he said, well, I would kill him, right? And Nathan said, well, that man is you. You're the man. So what in the world? And then once again, okay, Reverend Price's son, he stepped down for adultery, I guess. Now, is he back in the pulpit now? He's still a... No, he's not? He did just came out. He just came out with it. That it was adultery? No, no, no. No, no one that, knows what nobody knows. Why, he is now. why he stepped down? Nobody knows. Okay. Well, see, that really bottles my mind. Don't let it. But no, <laughs> don't worry about it. No, that's a passing fancy because... No, no, I didn't mean it in that sense, uh -huh. okay. But just being the nature that the way Lord made me, I like things to kind of balance, but I do understand they don't always balance. Right. So, <laughs> so here's another one. So if you truly, I know pastors say you have to forgive yourself, but if you truly into God through Jesus Christ, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing that cannot be resolved. This is my personal. Amen. The culture that he lives in. Uh It's, it's not the other has to be on. Amen. It's a culture that he moves in, he lives in. I understand that. That's what's going on with him. They, they won't forgive themselves. Certain things hap happen to you, they, but they throw, they throw you away completely. That's what they do. He's in that, in that culture. We we forgive one another, yeah. but they don't forgive you for certain things. They kill certain people. 
you dead. For, you make an error, you, are you dead? They kill you in ministry. That's what they do. Mm. Yes, sir. They don't forgive nobody. Everybody makes error. They make an error. Yes, sir. But they don't do that. Yes, and that's the problem. It's the culture that you're wrapped into. Mm. God forgives sin. He always does. He always does forgive sin. He does all, all that. But certain sins say God won't forgive. That's what they say. They don't say that by scripture. That's what they think. That's how they think. Mm. So he's a slave to his environment. That's what it is. That's his own creation. Mm -hmm. All right, well. Amen. <laughs> guess that's man. what Bible study is all about. All right. I started to say in Galatians 6, verses 2 and 4 are not uh, um, contradictory. In verse two, it talks about watching ourselves and carrying each other's burdens. Now, it's different, it's different Greek words, for one. And, and the other thing is, is that there are burdens that, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can, we can help each other shoulder. But in verse four, it's talking about the burden that's been assigned to me. What I'm supposed to do, I can only do that. The Lord gives me. Is that right, Pastor? The Lord gives me the ability, the obligation. Okay. I like that. So Pastor says, I can help you carry your burden, but not your obligation. And same way for, for us. Amen. Y'all understand that? Okay. There's, there's a, a, a different, different Greek words, and some people get that twisted, you know, when they read, when they read that. All right. Let's go to that next paragraph. Right. We're still in. We're still dealing with verse uh, one. What does it read? We should deal with those who are not as spiritually mature with Christian love and compassion. Being judgmental, uncaring, or harsh has no place here. We must always be mindful that we, are too, are subject to sin. That keep us on an even keel. We should never get beside ourselves. Who are the spiritual? The pastor asked the question, who are the spiritual? spiritual? Who are the spiritual? Galatians 5, that's your focus. But notice how prominent, if you go to chapter 5 of Galatians, notice how prominent the Spirit of God is. See, we try to do so many things on our own. And we fall flat on our face. All right, let's go to verse 2. What does it read? 
should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Read on. 1 Corinthians 13, what, what does it say? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, read with me, speaks of edifying as we read the following passage, consider the main element that makes edification possible. It reads, you are an angel, but do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but then I'd have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain. All right, let's stop there. So what is the element that we're talking about? What do we need? Love. And when we're dealing with each other in the Christian church, we should deal with each other in what? Love. Love. Let's read that last uh, uh, paragraph there. Love, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not conceited, it keeps no record of wrongs, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. All right. Always love. Now, if you go back to the twelfth uh, 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 to the twelfth chapter of First Corinthians, it talks about spiritual gifts. And and as Pastor pointed out a few minutes ago, the church at Corinth had an issue with spiritual gifts. They were very gifted. Very gifted. But they were immature, and they were, and, and they were prisoners of their culture. And so there was a lot of disunity and backbiting in, in, in the church. But Paul says, your gifts, they're God-given. It's wonderful, but I'll show you a more excellent way. That's the last thing he says in, in that uh, uh, 12th chapter. That more excellent way is love. And what kind of love? Are we talking about the feel-good love? I feel good about you today and not tomorrow. You feel good about me today, but not next week. What love are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, the love of, of brotherhood, of friendship? No, we're talking about agape. We're talking about the love of the will. We're talking about the love of the intellect. We're talking about loving despite how we feel. And our best example of that love was God the Father himself, who sent his only begotten son. When we were unloving, unlovable, he sent him to die in our stead. So if we're going to have the ability to forgive, if we're going to have the ability to uh, uphold and support, we have to have love. It has to be done in love. And it has to be in the love that you do because it's the right thing to do. Amen. We have to remember that. Any questions? Okay. This is, and this is a lifestyle practice, am I right, Dad? That's a lifestyle and a practice. Yeah, because I know before I beco you know, became faithful and coming to church, uh, I didn't have no controversies. When I wasn't coming to church, you know, before, you know, I was coming to church faithfully, I wasn't, I didn't have no controversy, but I, I, I became a member of the church, a body of Christ, and uh, I seen all kinds of conflicts in the church. People at odds with each other, you know, 
uh, there was a time I didn't care about applying these principles to my personal life. Yeah. Okay? But yet, you know, now that I'm a member of, of Park Avenue Church, and I visit other churches as well, uh, I, see, I see conflict in the church all over. People having personality conflicts and personality issues. But yet, uh, uh, now that I'm locked into the Christian faith, uh, I, <clears throat> you know, I try to put it into practice. It's a lifestyle practice for me. I want to. I want to be a good Christian. I want to be a servant of the Jesus, because the Lord is my is my, is my. Uh, he's the head shepherd of the church. He's the head of the church. Right. So I, I want to fall in, in in line with what he's talking about, because I remember a day when I, you know, I wasn't trying to apply this, yeah. no application at all. I was just freestyle. Okay. Mm -hmm. All I cared about was going to get a forty ounce, and I, I wasn't coming to church. My mom used to tell me, boy, you need to get to church, man. You need to get in the church. And I got in the church. I've been in part of the church for a long time now. Well, praise. And, it, and, it, and it's a lifestyle. It's, it's nothing to play with because the one thing about it, you know, we have, a, we, have a, we have an enemy that we got to fight against every day. And that's, well, three enemies, actually, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what we up against. We ain't fighting each other. But there's a spirit out there that we, we up against all, all day long. Amen. And they don't like you. Amen. It's real. It's a real fight every day. Thank you. I would say this: wherever we go, don't go looking for stuff. Yeah. Don't go looking for people's shortcomings. That's right, Dad. Because we're all human. Yeah. If I go looking for you and your behavior, what about mine? Right. Amen. What about mine? Mm -hmm. So let's not focus on. Uh, uh, le le let's not focus on what we see people do. Because the people got feet of clay too. Reverend Woodlock? Uh, yes, Deacon Smith, we got to be cognizant of the fact that we are the church. Uh, this building that we worship in, it's, you know, we worship here, but we are the church. Yes. And we are to classify how we treat the church, I mean, us, the people. How we treat each other. That's right. Okay, so so let's go looking for the good. Let's not go looking for somebody's shortcomings. Brother David. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what I have deducted in all our studies is when they had divisions in the church, it was a division about Christ and whether he was all human or all God, different things that the Gnostics were saying against what was right. But what I find in, so what I find in nowadays church, we don't have a division as to who Christ is. That's not our division. Our division comes on our social activities in the church and our financial and our political. That's where the division comes. That's when we don't, so our division is really not what it was in the old day. Our <clears throat> division is being in one mind and doing what's right. right. Okay. Now, I, I have to give an example. <laughs> uh, Brother White, he was a little disappointed that the program for the um, gospel singers on the 23rd, it wasn't an announced Sunday, okay? And I kind of feel bad for him. So, I just took the liberty to stop off before I came, and I bought some flyers. I mean, you know, I had some made, and I bought them today to give out to the people, you know, because the gospel singers, they are faithful. So the point I'm trying to get to is that I didn't harbor on the announcement wasn't made Sunday. I just took it upon myself to do something to possibly help because it's gonna be on the 23rd. So to those 
abuse. And another one, another example, Sunday, I know the program was long. So I told Bessie, I said, Bessie, I'll help you next year. I said, we gotta expedite, we gotta, you know, condense it, it was a little bit too long. Then I have another, <laughs> then, but I'm willing to help. I'm not willing to just complain and talk to somebody about it. All right. And then another one is, on Sunday morning, when we acknowledge the visitors <laughs> and the microphone is not on, I'm not gonna sit there every Sunday and say, Oh, that microphone is not on, blah, blah, blah. That's negative. You got to keep the positive energy. So I said, I got to go back and help the ushers. So I told Lanisha, I said, I'm going to come back on Sunday, and I'm going to make sure I'm going to help you with, with this. I'm doing it out of love. So when I came back Sunday, she said, Mrs. Livingston, I already got the microphone, and it's already on. I had already talked to the engineer. I said, praise the Lord. I said, now you got to be consistent. I said, because we don't need the, <laughs> I have to laugh. We don't need the visitors to start speaking, and there's no mic. And oh, well, we got to turn the mic on. And oh, we got, no, we don't have to do that. We just got to get it done before. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, like you said, it's a protocol now. There is a it's protocol. A, there is a if, protocol. If I may, I'd like to move on. <laughs> yeah. That's right, Dad. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do you off track? No, I'm not off track. No, I'm just let. No, no, no. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. The biggest thing, the biggest thing to remember is that we are body, we have to constantly the word is cartizo. We have to constantly mend relationship. We have to constantly mend our nets because relationships get strained. Right. Some relationships get broken. Pastor has taught us this isn't anything new. So we have to constantly be proactive. I call it proactive. Look for things. I think Sister Livingston made that quite clear. Look for things, look for the good, and look to, to help fix it, to maintain in the body, to, to maintain uh, 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 good relationships. Amen? Amen. Okay, where I was. All right, verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Let's read on. In obedience to the Father's will, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Here Jesus emphasizes that his mission was to fulfill the Father's purpose, not his own desires. In obedience to God the Father, Jesus endured the pain and the embarrassment on the cross. What we should have endured, Jesus endured in our stead. Isn't that true? Yes, Jesus went through what he went through uh, for us. Let's go to verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to each of us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures, and 
All right, let's stop there. And I, I want to emphasize this. Everything that was promised to the patriarchs, everything that was revealed to Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms was provided as teaching tools for Paul and the Christians of his day. Remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus? on the evening of the day that he resurrected, what did he, what did he do with those two disciples? He took them all the way back, didn't he? He taught them about the prophets. He taught them about Moses. He talked about the Psalms, all proof and verification that he is indeed the Messiah. He did that. And so... Not only were these things that Paul taught for the church of his day, but they apply to us in our day. And the truth and encouragement offered by the word of God is the basis of our hope, our heavenly expectation that God will fulfill every promise he has made when we believe in Christ Jesus through faith. Second Peter 3, 9 assures us of God's faithfulness. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's promises are steadfast, and his patience extends to all desiring salvation. But as Pastor Campbell has pointed out to us on previous occasions, God makes us want him through the working of the Holy Spirit. So it just ain't you. Searching. It's the most misunderstood verse in the Bible. Yeah. Can you give me that verse again, Dad? Second Peter three through nine. Okay, thank you. God is steadfast. The many are the elect. See, there, there's a difference, and you've taught us this too. There's a difference between God's desire and what he has decreed. He's speaking Greek now. <laughs> Desires and decreed. There's a difference. I just want to ask a question. Yes. He desires for us to be saved, holy, and righteous. But he decrees us to go out and spread the gospel. Am I right? That's true. He has commanded us to go. Commanded, yes. But, but here, here's, here's what this, this passage means when you talk about desire. God desires that all mankind should be saved. How do we know he desired it? Because he sent his only begotten son to die in their stead. But what's the next step? He didn't decree that they be saved. Those who are, 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 have been decreed are the ones who accept Jesus Christ as Savior Amen. through faith in his finished work. So we're talking about the elect those who have been roped off, those who have been chosen. You, you see the difference? Do you understand the difference? I see some faces that are going, Ugh. God's desire is that all men should be saved, but all men are going to be saved, are they? Can you find it, Brother John? First Timothy two in chapter four. Specific verse, Pastor? Verse four. Verse four. Two and four. First Timothy two and four. 
Rev. DeBose is going to go to the mic. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen, John. He's our go-to guy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it. Five, always messing with me. First Timothy 2 and 4. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I'm on the page, babe, but I don't see what. Okay. It says, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's verse 4. Okay. Desires all men to be saved. But to what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. All right. And what's the next verse? Verse 5 says, For well, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. That's the end of verse Amen. seven. Decree. What God desires, he does not decree. Well, we. Pastor, is your mic on? Yes. Well, let, let's have him plug. Let's. We let's don't have free him. will. Let's, let's plug him up. Yeah. We really don't have free will. Some of have free, have free will. Not at all. We say we say we do. But because we are sin, our will is corrupt. If God doesn't move on our, our behalf, we will never come, come to him on our own. So God takes initiative in our salvation. He comes after, after us. He gives us the want to. I have no want to without him moving on my, on my behalf. So here in this verse, it means, uh, it says that God's not willing God desires all men to be saved, but he did not decree it. If he did, everybody would be saved. Yeah, okay. Two different words are used there. Thelo and bulamai, two Greek words. That's behind the text. And people use that verse all the time. Wrongly, incorrectly. Who are the we? First, who are the we and who are the us? The elect. Read the context. This elect, those God has ordained to be to be saved. And you can't miss that. The scripture is plain when it comes to predestination and election. It's in the Bible. People have ignored that because they, they don't like they don't like to hear it. They think that salvation depends on what they're going to do. It's what God's going to do through you. He's the one that comes after us. We don't go after him. He comes. God gave you the want to, the desire to want it. On your own, you have no desire for God at, at all. Right. You've fallen and lost. Right. He saves sinners. That's what he does. Nah. He came after you. Thank Gave you a desire to want him. Don't want him. He, he yeah. wet your, app your appetite. Yes, sir. That's what he did. Yes, so God gets all the glory for my salvation. Yeah. I get none at all. He came after me. I didn't go after, after him. Now, folk who are involved in evangelism have problems with that evangelism god ordained us to go in the world to preach the gospel that's the means which god uses to bring folk to christ but still god's the one that work through everything because he told us to that's why we do it he told us to they got to go out that's right. Yeah. But God said go anyway. That's right. That's yeah. the means he uses to bring folks. Somebody told you about, about, about Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Somebody did. Yeah. Yeah. How, how should God it, how, was behind that. Yes. You say, you say how, they got to hear the word to That's know the right. word. That's right. All right. Right, bro. Yeah. Amen. Right. Amen. Well, the problem with mankind, he always wants to rob God of his glory. Yeah. He's always doing that. Yeah. Bragging on ourselves. What we do, how many folk we came to Christ. We're always doing that. Yes, sir. 
We just take glory from God and get on what we're doing. It's God get the glory. You get no glory. Just be faithful to God told you to do. We all have people and rag on themselves all the time. What are we doing? How are we doing so and so? That's stupid. That's nonsense. What are you doing? God gets the glory. He saved you who lost in sin. God's to be glorified and not you. Church do it all the time. I'm going to Cal Baptist. You're counting how many people are we baptized. And what we did. I said, I said, well, what the Lord going to do? <laughs> all right, Ben. All right, you ben. pressing for some kind of What the Lord going to do? He ain't doing nothing. You're doing everything. Taking the glory away from God. Yeah. Got to be right. careful how you do that. Do what you're supposed to do, but don't rob God of his glory. Amen. All right, Sister Davis is here. God bless you. Amen. It's always an encouragement to see Sister Davis. All right, well, we have encroached on pastor's time, so I hate to leave it where we're going to leave it, but we're going to have to leave it. But read your, uh, read your outlines, because there, there's some stuff in here that we wanted you to, to know, but circumstances... Uh, this is where the Lord wanted us to go today, so that's where we went. So God bless you, and we'll be going shortly to uh, the pastor's uh, part of the service. Amen. Amen.
All right, brothers and sisters, let us uh, come to order so we can resume our Bible study for this morning. These are your announcements for today, Wednesday, June 12, 2024. Today, we are celebrating Mother Miley Davis's birthday. Amen. All right, Ms. Davis. All right. This Friday, June 14th, she will turn 104 years old. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise yeah. his name. All right, all right. Praise him. <laughs> <laughs> Vacation Bible School begins. Week begins Monday, June 24th through Friday, June 28th, starting nightly at 5.30 p.m. All weekly announcements and events can be found on the church website, P-A-R-K-A-V-E-M-B-C dot O-R-G. Please see the announcements page and the church calendar page or you can always call the church office for information. The Park Avenue Baptist Church family are in bereavement with the celebration of life of Reverend Philip Madison will be Tuesday, June 18th at 11 a.m. here at Park Avenue. Memorial services for Cornell Braggs Jr. will be Friday, June 21st at 11 a.m here at Park Avenue. Donald Gregory and family, Donald's son, Dax, passed away. Service information is pending at this time. The family of Sister Betty Christmas, Brother Marshall and Tracy Anderson, and Minister Dwight Jones and family. So please remember all these families in your quiet time with the Lord that he will comfort and strengthen them with each passing day as they are missing their recently bereaved loved ones. So as we prepare to be taught by our beloved Pastor Dr. Ellie Campbell, let us, oh, let us approach the throne of grace and ask the Lord that he will give us understanding and spiritual enlightenment as we are being taught from the book of Acts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are once more again blessed and privileged by your, by your touch as we will awaken to a brand new day, yes. clothed in our right minds and with a reasonable portion of health and strength. Yes. We acknowledge you as the sovereign God of all creation, the maker of heaven and of earth, and the sustainer of all life for both man and beast. Yes. So as you regulate the beating of our heart, Lord, and the blood running warm in our veins, may we as followers of Jesus Christ not grieve but quench the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, but let him have his way in us, Lord, that we may magnify and exemplify and and manifest the fruit of the Spirit as we seek to do your will your way. We understand, O oh God, that in and of ourselves we can do nothing that is pleasing unto thee. So we ask you, Lord, that we submit and surrender to the Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, we ask that you comfort the families who are in bereavement at this time, uh, the Madison, Smith, and Campbell families, uh, our Sister Lisa Braggs, our family, our Brother Donald Gregory, and family, our Sister Betty Christmas's family, Brother Marshall and Tracy Anderson, and Minister Dwight Jones. So we ask you, Lord, to thank you in advance for how you will comfort and strengthen them as they are uh, bereaved of their loved ones. And now we ready our hearts to, to be nourished and taught by our beloved pastor. We ask, you put, we ask, oh Lord, that you will help us to block out of all distractions and focus intently and purposely from the book of Acts, chapter 12, beginning at the fifth verse. And it's in Jesus' name and for sake we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Here now is our beloved pastor, Dr. L. Lee Campbell. Thank you, Brother John. Good afternoon to everyone. And Sister Davis, happy birthday. 104 years old. On the 14th. On the 14th. Mm -hmm. 104 years old. Amazing. By the grace of God. Amazing. Think about that? Yeah. God is blessed to be here that, that long. And still have a good, a good mind. Mm -hmm. God is certainly blessed. Right. 
Mrs. Davis. So we won't be here long today. It's time to have the celebrations for Sister Davis. You said we're in chapter 12? Yes, sir. Okay, I thought we were in chapter 12. Okay, my bad. Okay, I'm <laughs> sure another. I want them, <laughs> okay, I, I got so many notations. Yeah, we're on the, we begin at chapter 13. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. Yes, sir. But I'll let you keep up with everything. I do. Yeah. All right, the gospel is going throughout the world. The key verse, Acts 1 8. What Jesus said the church to do is doing it right now. It did what the Lord told it to do. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, that was going throughout the whole known world. After Stephen was martyred, the church went running. God stirred their nest. And God just stirred your nest. God wants something done, he gets it done. He makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Gets you doing what he wants you to do. He's done that for some of us. Make you uncomfortable where you are, what you are doing. So you can do what he wants you to do. And so, the gospel has already gone to Antioch of Syria. Chapter 11 of Acts. Mm -hmm. They heard, the church heard that it was revival broke out in Antioch. They sent Barnabas there, the son of encouragement. Then send Peter, send Barnabas. They send the right person. He had a gift of encouragement, a consolation. That was his gift. And sometimes you can send the wrong people to the wrong place. You can't send everybody to certain places. You can't send everybody. They're not, they're not the one to go. Peter was not the one to go. He tear up stuff. They send Barnabas. When he goes there, he sees in the same church, Jew and Gentile in the same church. Jew and Gentile in the same church. He said he saw the grace of God. You can see God's grace. And people. Jew and Gentile in the same church, the same congregation. Unheard of in Jerusalem church. Unheard of. All Jews in church at Jerusalem are proselytes. Converts who became Jews before, before they, they became Christians. In the church. He saw the grace of God. And God's grace was shown in the life of these people, these Gentiles, the Jews, all that together. Amazing thing for him to see. It was God doing it. God was doing it. He tells them to cleave to the Lord. I remember Moses' favorite verses with that verse in the 11th chapter of Acts. Cleave. Cleave to the Lord. He saw the grace of God and they cleave to the Lord. He told them. And then they were first called Christians in Antioch. Mm -hmm. They were called the way. But now they're called Christians. Mm -hmm. A nickname, a name of ridicule, embarrassment, but Christians embrace the name. Yes. It's meant to embarrass them, to make fun of them at first. But Christians embrace the name. Mm -hmm. Like those who are, we were Baptists. It was called Anabaptist. They brought Anna now they called it just Baptist. We came out with what's called the Free Church Movement. Amen. Always has been someone like us, but didn't call us by the name. And no, if some of you go on to the new members of the class? Yeah. The Brother Smith teaches us about the origin of our movement. What happened? And they knew it was John the Baptist. It came out of what's called the free church movement. That went underground. When Constantine became emperor, the church went, went underground. When the church and state married, went underground. That's what we came out of. It came out of what's called the free church movement. That knew with John the Baptist. We teach that in the new middle class. All right, so at the church over there, now let's read verse, verse one. All right, sir. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manim, 
who had been brought up with Herod the Tetra and Saul. All right, in the church. In the congregation, the word ecclesia for church. Ecclesia means assimilate. I mean call out. Actually, the word church, Tyriacus, refers to the building, mm -hmm. right. not to the people. This is really the building. This is really the, the church, this building. What happened to Constantine, you know, it, it was when King James told them, when they translate the Bible, when you see Ecclesia, translate that, that church, but don't translate church. Ecclesia translates, it means the people. Ecclesia, we are the people of God. The Ecclesia, the call of the mm -hmm. But we were named something, they named it, but it really wasn't named that. The word church comes from the word Kyriakos. That means, refers to, the, it means belonging to the Lord. It's found two places in the Greek New Testament. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, the Lord's Supper. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, the Lord's day. Kuriakis, belonging to the Lord. How things get mixed up. And Con King James, for his own reason, told the translator, when translate the, the Bible, translate Ecclesia Church. That's what he did. Pastor, is that uh, word Kuriakis, does that uh, start with a C or a K? Start with a K. All right, thank you. What's that? No, 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 we 13. The first verse of chapter 13. We 13. So in the church, in the congregation, all kinds of folk in the church. In Antioch. They, they, they had prophets. The prophet here means a fourth teller. Not necessarily a fourth teller. One who speaks forth the word of God. Inspired preacher. They received the revelation from the apostles. They preached what the apostles taught them. Here the word means a fourth teller, not a fourth teller, but a fourth teller, a prophet. And it says in the church, they had a man named Niger who was called black. A black person in the church. In the real church. Now different shades of black. That's true. All right. That's blue black, real black. Blue black. I know it's blue black. Blue. It's rather, rather black. <laughs> now he's called not he's called black. They call him black because he was black in the church. Men, there were men there who were from North Africa. The gospel went to Africa before it went to Europe. You from Munich? Took the gospel to Ethiopia. These folk with pigmentation in their skin, they had dark skin, like you have. In the church. They had no problems there. You know why we have what is called a black church? Because of racism. All right, best. Amen. It wasn't supposed to be like this. But they accept you in another church. Second class citizens in another church. That's why we have our own. Now we have our own culture. And it's right to have your own culture. If, if you go to the church and speak Spanish, the Spanish people go when you speak Spanish. That's where it's supposed to go. Language barrier. Should not be a racial barrier. That's why we have a racial barrier. Because of racial prejudice. Mm -hmm. It's not God's intention. We shouldn't have been all in the same church. Here it is, they're all in the same church. Black and white folk, brown people, all in the same church. This man is called black. He must do it out. Everybody knew he, he was black. You can't escape when you're black, people know you. Mm. <laughs> I heard that. In the big crowd, a lot of people, you stand out. <laughs> all right. And nothing wrong with being black. Nothing wrong with being black. Why you put your color down? Why you lower yourself? Why you talk about you? Why you do that to yourself? 
Why do you have an inferiority complex? Why do you think you're ugly? Why do you think that? When God made you the way you are, Amen. for his own glory. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Why you Stay alive. Be black and bright. You listen to be good about yourself. Especially if you're a Christian, thank God he saved you too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why do we do that to ourselves? We have people who put ourselves down, laugh at ourselves, make fun of us. We think we're not as good. But the Lord didn't have that problem. We have the problem. In this church, was an integrated church, folk, all people in that church. And the Lord was ministering, look what he said in the next verse. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Okay, as they were ministering, here's the word here. Lateral, 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 lateral. It means the, the minister. They're ministering. They were doing service. They were preaching and teaching and they were praying. In the church. What they were doing. And they were going, they, they were fasting that they were not eating food. No time to eat when you worship. It was like, we don't eat in here. We eat in here. Yeah. That's the side for worship. We eat in here. We don't eat in there. The place we, we don't eat. And worship, we don't, eat, we don't serve a meal during worship services. Yeah. And they were fasting. They were, they were too busy praying to eat. Not just the word of fasting, it used to be fasting, but they were praying and doing without food. You get so involved with the spiritual, you have no time for the physical. Jesus did. 40 days of wilderness, didn't he? He was praying, preparing himself for his ministry. And what about us? How many times you take in preparation? You think about that? Sometimes you'd be ashamed of yourself. The Lord took all that time to pray to prepare the new ministry, and we don't pray hardly at all. I'm embarrassed sometimes. I talk to the Lord. Spend time with him in preparation. So the church was praying and preaching and teaching the word of God. In the church house, that's what they were doing. They're there for business. They were doing ministry. Now, they're doing ministry and not this word here. Proskuneo means worship. It means to bow down. Proskuneo, the word for worship. And then in the St. John chapter 4, verse 20, 24, the Lord told my worship and spirit and truth. That's the word that's used there, proskuneo. It means, it, mean, it means to bow, to bow down. It really means a kiss. It means a kiss. Caneo, kiss. Cross in front. Kiss in front. It means kiss in front. Pastor Cam, can I ask you a question concerning fasting? Uh, uh huh. Some people can't fast because of med medical reasons, like myself. I'm a diabetic. But is there, certain, is there different types of fasts that you can partake of? If you want to fast, you can do that. But do it yourself. But like I might fast a meal or something I'm, like I'm, that. I don't need to know anything about it. Okay. Yeah, because I was wondering, just because health, health purposes, I, well, I can't fast it. a full day. Well, don't do it then. Okay. You ain't got to do it. Listen, the Lord, the Lord told the Jews to fast on one day. Nope. Day of atonement. That's it. They took it down every day. They did that yeah. But the Lord gave them only one day. Yeah. On the day of okay. atonement, they were to afflict their souls on the day of atonement. Happened okay. in September. The only day the Lord gave them. But they took it on every day they did. Yeah. Not, nothing wrong with that if you want to do it. But if you do fast, make sure it's a private thing. Don't go around with a long face. Yeah, exactly. They boast, it on their they boast about fasting, brag on fast. You don't do that. I was a group of people said, child, I'm going to fast today. <laughs> I don't want to know that. You go ahead and fast. I don't need that. that. <laughs> but see, we do everything to try to show ourselves up. That's our problem. Look at me. Look at me. Well, what people look at? Why do you want folks to look at you like that? 
That's our purpose. We want to brag on what we do. Look at what I'm doing. You rob God of his glory and try to look at yourself. We do too much of that. Yeah. Showing our cell phone. Yes, they're right. You fast, go ahead and fast yourself. I don't need to know anything about it. That's your business. You and God. But prayer and fasting should go together. That's just a nice sip of food. If you're not praying, you're the praying. Why are you fasting? Let me show you something here. Well, um, you got to be a Bible student. Yeah. So they were serving the Lord mm -hmm. to prayer and preaching and teaching the Word of God. Yes, sir. That's what they were doing. In the church at Antioch, or Syria. And then it says that you read verse. No, I'll stop that verse three. two. Okay. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Okay. The Spirit spoke in the church. The Spirit spoke in the church. The Holy Spirit is a person, not the either thing. He's the third person of, of the Godhead. Not it. Not a thing. Not a piece of person. He speaks. He can be quenched. You can quench him. You can grieve him. Yeah. You can ignore him. You can lie to him. And that's the survival lie to the Holy Spirit. You can lie to him. You can't lie to any energy, lie to a person. It's a person. The Lord uses the masculine gender in John's gospel in the 14th chapter and the 16th chapter. Yeah. He called them he. Yeah. Right. Well, let me show you something here. He should be referred to as a person, not the other thing. So the Holy Spirit Spoke in the church. He, he can make his will known. He can let people know what he wants. To he probably spoke to one of the, the prophets, one of the teachers there. He spoke to them and said, this is, what, this is what I want. This is what I want. He says what? Separate farmers and saw for the work where I've called them. Mm -hmm. Sit them apart for that work. The, the Spirit said, sit them apart for that work. That's their work. That's their ministry. He made the team, put the team together. Barnabas and Saul. The work I've called them to do. They're not called to stay here, they're called to go out. That's their ministry. These fellows go stay in the church of Antioch, but they're going out. Everybody doesn't go out like a minister. God has not called everybody to go out into the field. Some have been called to serve God in the broader area. God did. The Holy Spirit did that. They didn't do it on their own. It wasn't their idea. It was the Holy Spirit's idea. He wanted them to go. And when God, when God sends you to go, he gives you what you need to get the job done. He never calls nobody to do a work if you can't do the work. You can do it. So they're going out. Come on, stop. What, what time is it? Minutes well, it's time to stop for you. Have any questions on what I said so so far? You mentioned earlier about uh, having a rest, a rest of the spirit, and you said that's that's the Holy Spirit uh, stirring you up. Sometimes to uh, do a, do a certain work. Sometimes, just like in that particular verse you just read, it said that uh, the Holy Spirit separated yeah, Paul yeah. and Barnabas yeah, yeah. for the work of the ministry. Right now, uh, until you really uh, uh, I'm trying to find a certain word. Uh, become obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading. Uh, you're going to be restless till you do the, do the work that the Holy Spirit called you out for. You'll be convinced that is true. Yeah. But there also is a call for, for preparation. Yeah. Some folks just want to get out in front of the people. Yeah, yeah. They want to do the hard work. 
Yeah, that happens. The call of the gods is a call for preparation. Okay. You want to talk, but you want to learn. You want to spend time doing the hard work. Right. Some folks just want to get up front. They want to be up front. They want to, do, they want to go to school. <laughs> yeah. They don't do anything else. That's what they want to do. It's the hard work. The work, the groundwork of preparation. Now, they, Paul is prepared to go. And so is Barnabas. Uh-huh. So the Spirit will launch him out to do, to do the work. So here they go to do the work. He speaks to the church. The church obeys the Holy Spirit. And, and that by sending them forth, they send them forth. They prayed for them, put hands on them, set them apart, and send them forth. They gave them money to go. They didn't go without money. They supported the work. They didn't support the mission. They supported the work. They gave them finance to go. They didn't go just on their own. They support the work. And we support evangelism. We support missionaries. That's what we do. You don't go, but someone else is going. And I believe the people, Pastor Volk, who were so worried about where the money went. Yeah. Give the missionary, give missionary, where the money go? Well, it's our job to support the missionary work. You can't worry about that. Make sure you go into a reliable place. You can't get on, on, on the boat and follow the money over there with to see where it's going. It's our job to support the work of the Lord. And we need to do more when it comes to missionary work than what we do. On the fifth Sunday, we used to have a special offering for missionary. We're going to do, start doing that again. Mm-hmm. Support missionary work. Those who spread the gospel in different places. Yeah. What are we supposed to do? The church always done that. Supported the work of those who spread the gospel. What do we do? And so the church sends them forth, but they give them the money to go. They're not going without money. They support the work. So they can preach the gospel. Now, Paul went, sometimes Paul had to stop and make tents until the money came. And he wouldn't let the Corinthians support him at all. He wouldn't let the Corinthians support him at all. He wouldn't let the Corinthians support him. He wouldn't let them do it. Because they brag on stuff. They did it for the wrong reason. He didn't like the attitude towards giving. They were giving grudgingly. No, he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He didn't let them do it. And they got mad because he wouldn't let them do it. He said, I'm going to let you do it. Because your attitude is bad. He let, he let the other people support it. He wouldn't let them do it. Because their attitude was bad about supporting the work. They were doing something Paul didn't like. Well, they had a right attitude. Yeah, bad attitude. Oh. The Corinthians. All right. I got stop it today. Any questions? If not, yes, ma'am, you got a question? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, we stop there. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for Sister Davis. Yeah. Yeah, you've yeah. given her to be among us, that you keep her in your care. Keep us, Lord, as we celebrate her birthday, that you've given her to be with us all these years. To sanctify the food of our bodies. Bless those who brought the food. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. They did. They did. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. I can't sing. Sister Lee was on the phone, so I'm going to be singing. So we'll ask Sister Pat if she'll lead us in Happy Birthday. I know. Good to see you. Okay. All right, everybody with cameras, I think this is the time. Happy.
right, big wrong. You got it. You got it. Right. I know. 